I'm Todd Jones, recovering from 30 years as a sports writer. Thanks for joining me as I sit down with some of the best sports writers of our time who knew the greatest athletes and coaches and experienced firsthand some of the biggest sports moments of the past half century. We'll share stories behind the stories, some we've only told each other. Pull up a seat on Press Box Access. Jeanette Howard is a sports writer who likes to say she doesn't write about sports. She writes about people in sports. And she's done so as a best-selling author of books and her distinct columns and stories, especially in long form, for newspapers, magazines, and websites have been among the best produced over the past 40 years. Jeanette Howard is a byline that always rewards the reader. And she's cool, too. She doesn't take any crap off anyone. Jeanette was tough enough to navigate the good old boys club of sports media and help pave a path for other female journalists. And she's kind enough to join us on this episode. Jeanette, welcome to Press Box Access. Thanks, Todd. Nice to be here. Good. I'm so glad you're joining us. I will say congratulations, too. 1982 was when you uh, broke into professional sports writing, which is kind of like professional wrestling when you think about it. <laughs> especially <laughs> especially for a woman or a minority coming up through the ranks in the 80s. A bunch of old white guys running around. But, yeah, uh, so 40, I did have a 40, few. 40, 40 years now. 40 years. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. I had a few guys. <laughs> it's just, it's about wisdom. Wisdom. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. That's it. <laughs> I've got lots of wisdom. <laughs> well, I've, I've enjoyed so many of your columns and stories over the years. I really get a kick out of the eight words in your Twitter bio. It says, adventure never stops, seen a lot of stuff. I just think that captures captures well, sports writing so well. Yeah, and you know, it's funny, and I'm sure you can relate to this as a former newspaper person. I, um, I The first paper I worked at almost folded. The second one... I worked at did fold. <laughs> I, <laughs> I went. I was laid off twice, um, including at ESPN, which I thought would be in you know in, immune to any kind of the market tribulation and volatility that I've seen. And when people ask me about my career, I'm always like, I had a great life. Like I had a, right, you know, exactly. Yeah, and so it's yeah. uh, it's funny. I'm not sure that. Uh, People get that maybe when you get when you get into it, you know that it's going to be a ride, and you know you might relocate a couple times and and um, make your family mad occasionally because you don't show up for things. <laughs> oh yeah, but, uh, right. Yeah, but um, it, it's been great. It's been really great. What's the first thing that comes to mind when somebody says, "What's it? What's it been like to be a sports writer for forty years?" Well, it's funny. I, there was a young guy that came here when I was still working. I live in New York when I was still working at ESPN, and he was complaining. He said, you know, this job would be great if we didn't have to write the stories. <laughs> oh, yes. I have a friend, Jack Brennan, in Cincinnati used to always say that. Great yeah, job I, if you didn't have to write. <laughs> yeah. And I told him, I said, you know, well, then it'd be season tickets, man. Like, you, <laughs> you can't, exactly. um, you know. And so I, I think the thing that's been funny because I'm not in daily journalism anymore is you get so used to having that backstage access and, and, that sort of view where you, a lot, so many of your questions are answered. And it, it's been a transition for me to to be sort of at a remove now and not know why things happened um, mm -hmm. to the extent I would have before. And, um, and to not feel like I have um, as informed a, uh, a grasp on what's going on as I did before. But, you know, even if I were still in daily journalism, that would also be a function of how the business has changed. And, um, it's just more acute when I'm doing other stuff. Right, right. Well, Jeanette, you've written as well as anyone in the last 40 years. Books, articles, long-form, investigative, columns, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, Washington Post, 10 years at Newsday, a couple stops at the Detroit Free Press. But I want to start with um, the job that you had in between those Motor City stops. And that's a, a, a place that's near and dear to my heart because I was a young journalist at the time. And that's the Na National Sports Daily. And that ran from 1989 to 1991. You know, the created by the great Sports Illustrated writer Frank DeFord, The National. I still have a few copies in my attic, by the way. Yeah, me too. <laughs> well, it was, it was the best job I ever had. And it was also constant chaos and you know we were so proud of the the product that we put out and and yet it was by the end 
it was an inescapable conclusion that we really did deserve to fold <laughs> because <laughs> the yeah. business side was such a wreck. And um, there, were, there were so many boondoggles going on and excesses. There was a guy who, you know, won't be named, John Feinstein. <laughs> was, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh-oh, sources. <laughs> who, was, who was at the French Open and his cat died and he said he had to come home because his wife was upset. And they were like, all right, you know. <laughs> oh, okay, we'll just hop on the next flight. Yeah, yeah you know, stuff like that where yeah. there, were, there were ego clashes because there were so many marquee writers. There were, you know... Um, there were story, you know, just excesses. Like we needed photos taken, mugshots for our for our columns, and they had decided that we each of us had to fly into New York <laughs> for these mugshots, which turned out to be. Um, being taken what, by is there the, like one camera in all of America that can take was, a mugshot? It's right, in New York. That's what I said. We could have gone to a passport office, but we're we. I, you know, it was the publisher's wife. It was a total boondoggle. I get to the apartment. I knock on the door. They open the door and they go, "Who are you?" And I said, "I'm John Ed Howard, Detroit Free Press." And, you know, I was right on time. And they said, "Oh, damn," because. Um, because I was from Detroit and my first name, they thought I was black. And so they had a makeup artist. And I was like, there's a makeup artist for the mugshot? And they're like, yeah. And oh her, name was, her name was Cheyenne. And she had to run down the street on the Upper East Side back to her salon to get the makeup for a white person. And, you know, it was just that kind of stuff. So by the time we folded, everybody was both heartbroken and also kind of not surprised because... Um, it was the greatest ride we ever had, um, but um, as a business well, I think proposition. About, I think about the takeout team that you guys, that you were yeah. part of. You were you're on a team with Charles Pierce, Peter Richmond, Ian Thompson. That's a pretty good lineup. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> and we had to write one 3,500-word story a day, I mean, not a day, uh, yeah, yeah, a week at least. And, um, you know, which meant you would turn them around pretty quickly. And uh, it was, uh, we always say it was the best job we ever had all of us because um charlie you know remains brilliant and and just mm-hmm. um uh, prescient everything else some of the stories he's written both about politics and sports are just classics um right and um and ian and i were both about the same age and and just looking around going can you believe this you know and we knew each other from when I was in Detroit covering the Pistons and he was on the Celtics during the playoffs. And Peter Richmond also was just um, an exquisite writer who went on to GQ with Charlie after we folded. Our editors were David Granger, who ended up running uh, GQ, and, um, or is it Esquire? And um, Rob Flader, who was running uh, Sports Illustrated's features for a while. So... It was like an impeccable place, and then Frank DeFord was in charge of all of it. And um, and so the stories that we did were um, such a privilege because you, you got the kind of um, the rigor and the discipline and the, the editing that was rare for newspapers where there's that daily churn. Well, one of the stories that you wrote that still, you know, still remains... One of my all-time favorites, especially I was at such an impressionable age at the time when I was just soaking up anything that people were writing around the country. And that was a story called The Making of a Goon. Yeah, I, I mean, it's one of the stories I'm most proud of in my career. Um, you know, he, I lived in Detroit still because they hired me away from the Detroit Free Press. And um, actually, it's funny, it was the first story I wrote for the National, the very first story I wrote for them. And I had change jobs so quickly that I had to go and get a loaner computer from Apple because the National was so new and not organized that they didn't have computers to give us. (laughs) So (laughs) I wrote it, yeah, I wrote it on a desktop computer that I was on loan. And I um, I actually, I just, you know, it's how a lot of stories start. I had just posed a question to Rob Flader. I said, I don't, uh, we had in Detroit two you know, goons at the time, Joey Koser and Bob Probert, who was actually a, a scarier guy. And, and um, it was rare for teams to have two of them. And I would have done Probert, but he was in prison. <laughs> oh, that, yeah. <laughs> that's an issue. <laughs> yeah. So, um, he, you know, 
the fights that you know weren't accessible. So <laughs> I um, he was in prison with Jim Baker. It turns out in Min- in a federal prison in uh, Minnesota, which was another story because he got Baker on the prison hockey team. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, uh, a pretty good team. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you know, when he got arrested, he hit a tree, and and the cops showed up, and and Probert was laying on the ground, and he looked up at them and said, "Charge me with the usual guys." <laughs> 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 you know? So he would have been good too. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, Joey was the one who was you know out, <laughs> and um, it's a funny thing. I some stories just come together. I did that in just a couple days of reporting, and I talked to him. and um, And there's a story you might remember in the in an anecdote in the story about him um, getting called up from the miners to the Red Wings, and the first and he had he had knocked out a guy the night before, and um, and didn't know that the cut on his knuckle was from the guy's tooth and his hand mm. blew up overnight. And uh, there's so much bacteria when that happens that um, you can get gangrene and you could actually, the tendons will start to rot within a day. So mm. he shows up for morning practice and he couldn't get his glove on. And um, so the story is about the, the sacrifices that, that a guy like that makes and how you're sort of steered into it. Nobody really grows up wanting to punch people in the face for a living. And... And just how, um, you know, the sort of ethical and moral dilemmas that he went through and had trouble talking about, um, but you, it comes through, and also the opinions of some of his victims. And um, so it was a really nuanced story, and um, it sort of examined this culture in hockey that uh, that that values these guys and, and why. And at times it can almost seem a little a little reasonable. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, it was a type of journalism that was, you know, it took you behind the scenes. It took you into, like you said, a nuanced area of a sport. Um, you know, this life of a goon, this enforcer, um, you know, you might talk to them once in a while after a game or a certain fight, but you never really knew what was going on in their life. And I think that's the type of journalism that I was attracted to. And is that what you got you into sports writing to begin with? Is the idea of going farther than what the result of the game is? Yeah, it's what I was more interested in. I, um, I, I had never um, really, you know, I, I love sports and I love the excitement and all those things, but um, I was really interested in the people and I, I always say, you know, people, I would encounter people sometimes that go, oh, I don't care about sports. I don't care. And I was like, I don't really write about sports. I ha- I write about people in sports. And it's a whole different thing. And you intersect with every issue in the world. And mm-hmm. and so that was always my fascination. When I was a beat writer with the Pistons, it was great experience um, getting to know people on a day-to-day basis and, 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 you know, how leagues work, how athletes' mindsets, the grind, you know, all of it. But I wanted to get off it within a year because I felt like it, I was never going to find out how well I could write if I was always having to hit a 10, 15 deadline. Right, yeah. all right. And so um, I, I, uh, it was what always attracted me was long-form stuff, and people always kind of steered me toward that, fortunately. Um, so it worked out well. But, you know, journalism has changed. You used to be able to get the access and that's, I would have a hard time today if I were still in daily journalism because of that. Well, you knew those tough guys at the Red Wings, and you knew some other tough guys in Detroit, too. You mentioned uh, the Detroit Pistons. You were on the beat for the bad boys yeah. in the <laughs> 1980s. Speaking of tough guys, <laughs> yeah. um, what a team, right? I mean, we're talking about one of the all-time teams, and I think in some ways they get a little lost. They're almost like a bridge between the Lakers, Celtics dynasty, to the Jordan years of dominance. But when you think about it, that was the bad boys. That was a Detroit team that really defined, you know, the way basketball was being played in those days in the eighties. Um, what was it like covering the Detroit bad boys? Um, it was remarkable. And I was lucky because I, I got the job um, the year before they really took off. So, you know, I got to see the the whole rise. They were pretty much a 500 team once Isaiah got there, Isaiah Thomas, and um, and that's when I took over the beat. And um, so, 
they were full of characters, but they were young and they all grew together. And of course, um, Chuck Daly was the coach, Daddy Rich. It was his nickname. Daddy Rich, right. <laughs> now tell me about that name, Daddy Rich. Tell us. <laughs> well, it's a great story. He was coaching in Cleveland for Ted Stepien's Cleveland Cavaliers. And at the time, Stepien was the worst owner in sports and nobody wanted to play for Cleveland. They lost all the time. Chuck never got his first shot at head coaching um, in the NBA until he was, I forget, in his late 50s, I think. And, um, but it was such a miserable existence for everyone that, there was, that he had a secret deal with the players because he was such a clothes horse that if one of them got traded, they owed him an ultra suede jacket, sports jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It was like being paroled, and he's like, yeah, pal, I got to stay. You get to go. So they had to buy him an ultra suede jacket. <laughs> 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 when did he move on to the silk ties? <laughs> <laughs> Once he got the gig, you know, the, the head coaching job. But, I, you know, people didn't know. He, he had one of the top five winning percentages in the Big Five as a head coach college when he was at Penn. And, you know, not exactly a basketball factory. And that's when Jack Ramsey and guys like that were in Philly. So um, Chuck was an exceptional coach and uh, a great guy. His, like, you know, Irish went to mass every day, you know, gave up candy for Lent. But then he had this style that was, um, you know, and he said it always went back to his father, who was a traveling salesman. Chuck grew up in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, and he worked in an abattoir in the, you know, the pits where they would put, I guess it's lime on hides, cow hides mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. And it's nasty, st stinking work. And he just thought there's got to be something better, you know. And so he got out. But... He was a great guy, and he understood the guys on the team perfectly. And Isaiah was this six-one force in nature. And you know, I just saw him the other day talking to Trey Young, and he—he he was still saying this. He said it at the time that he used to look at Magic and Bird and those guys, Jordan, and say, "If I was six-nine, none of these mother, you know, <laughs> mothers could guard me. They'd all be in trouble." You yeah, know? you forget. He was 6'1". Think yeah, about that. Yeah, and he got, yeah. that's when you could knock guys down and beat them up. And he, I have undying admiration for, I mean, how tough he was. I saw Carl Malone opened a, a cut over his eyebrow when we were in Salt Lake once. Um, and I don't know, he had to, I mean, he had to get at least 30 stitches. He went off and he was so mad. He came back to the game after halftime and, you know, scored some outrageous amount of points and they won the game. He was like that tough. And same when they played the Lakers in the finals, he blew up his ankle and um, yeah. still played. And by then he had a patch over his head because he got hit in the head. And he was his will was just amazing. And the way he kind of whip-cracked those other guys in the line. And, um, and then there was Bill Lambeer, who was the rich kid's son, who, you know... Um, Pretty obtuse about race relations. <laughs> now, um, I want to ask you something. Was Bill Lambert as big an asshole as he seemed to be on the court? Um, I think he knew that's the only way he could play. And, you know, he has a good side. He really does. There, there were, he knew that um, he had to be kind of a provocateur and get charges and annoy people. And, um, and you know, one of his... But he... It's funny. He... Uh, he got on me once for some story that I wrote, and, and uh, I just looked at him. He was making a scene in the locker room and yelling at me. It's like my second year, and he was yelling something at me. And I said, you better just be grateful we don't write everything we know about you. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> and, he, and he just went like, the 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so Jeanette, could, Jeanette's firing his guns here. <laughs> so he what? could be he could be you know steered. <laughs> That's good. The That's funny good. thing about him, and I always have said this, and I you know I never asked Isaiah if it were true, but I think I think Isaiah knew they needed him to win, and the, you know there were these big ream of stories about how it was almost like a buddy movie, like the little black guy and the big white guy, and they were best friends and yada, yada, yada. And I mean, you know, they were friendly and it was true to an extent, but um, I really think it was another one of the calculations Isaiah made that if we're going to win, we need this guy, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, because he would show up for training camp and they would have to run, I forget, I think it was a mile, 
And he would get about halfway through it and have to puke in the garbage can on the side of the track. <laughs> <laughs> Lame beer must have had too many beers. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, those teams had Joe Dumar was a rookie my first year, and then Rodman and John Sally came the second year. So, And then Rick Mahorn got traded for, I think it was the third year, and... I was. He was at that time part of McFilthy and McNasty, if you remember, with the Washington oh, yeah. Bullets. And oh, yeah. he sh and I thought, oh no, you know, because women's sports writing was still, you know, women in sports writing was still really only about five years old as far as equal access to the locker room and stuff like that. <laughs> I thought, oh no, when they traded for him, and he showed up, and we were in Indy, and he looks at me and he says, "You're going to find out why they call me Sick Rick." <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> And it didn't turn out to be true. He turned out to be one of the best guys, uh, you know, the best guys on the team. A great guy. Still a great guy. When I see him, I, you know, I'd love to catch up with him. They had Vinnie Johnson, the microwave, you know, because mm -hmm. he could heat up in a minute and, you know, that kind of stuff. It was a great cast of characters. You mentioned Rodman. And really, Rodman was kind of a shy, young guy at, at the yeah. time, right? He wasn't quite this cartoon character no. that we all came to know. No. I, you know... Like I said, he got drafted the second year I was on the beat. And um, and I remember when they drafted him, they were thrilled. And they said, he was taken in the second round, and they said, we got this guy, and he's raw, but he's an extraordinary athlete, and we think he could really be something. And when he showed up, he came from a little university, NAIA, Southeastern Oklahoma State, and um, it was total shock, you know, to him that his life turned out this way. And when he got to the first workout, they were probably, I would say, five minutes into it, and they had to yank him out of the training camp workout because he flunked his EKG. He was so excited that his heart was pounding so much mm. that they had to pull him and you know redo everything before he could start again. But he was. He was a really endearing guy um, who hadn't experienced a lot. He had a church lady mom and uh, some sisters. His dad, you know, we've since found out, had the perfect name. I think his first name was Philander, and he literally has 20-some children. Wow. He lives in the Philippines now, I guess. So he had a really hard upbringing. And, um, you know, Chuck Daly became really his surrogate father. And when Dennis kind of spun out and became the guy with the, the hair and, you know, everything else was after Chuck Daly got fired. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, he got pushed out. They didn't say he got fired, but he, he was, for all intents and purposes, pushed out. And Chuck was ready to move on it by that point, too. And um, and Dennis was so distraught that he, he's talked about this since. He he sat in the parking lot with a twenty two rifle on the um, seat of his car, and he was going to kill himself, but he fell asleep. Wow. And then he woke that's up. How fragile, that's how fragile they are, right? I mean, sometimes you forget that. They're yeah. just people. Yeah. Just the trauma, I think, in his life. I mean, he was working in a bump shop, in an auto bump shop, and at an airport concession stand, you know, stuff like that. But I remember we were both about the same age. I was only like, you know, whatever, 24, 25. And I remember talking to him once, and I, we were talking about how your life turns out in ways you don't expect. And I said, uh, you know, everyone called him Worm. And I said, Worm, did you ever steal the tiles at a hotel? And he said, because, you know, we were staying in nice hotels. Mm -hmm. Chuck always made sure we were like at the Ritz and the whatever, <laughs> yeah. Santa Monica, you know. Um, and I said, Worm, did you ever steal the towels in the hotel? And he said, all the time, Joe. <laughs> 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 then he told me, he said, he said, you know, he said, I'm afraid. I'm afraid if people really know who I am, they wouldn't like me. Mm. And I always remembered that because when, when good stuff happened to him, like when he won Defensive Player of the Year award or things like that, he would cry at the press conference. You know, he would, yeah. he would just cry. And uh, I think it was just that gratitude. And I, I think when Chuck got fired, it, it made him more cynical about the business and he changed um, in a lot of ways. Mm. Well, what a collection of talent and characters. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the Pistons, uh, they lost the NBA Finals in 88 to the Lakers, but then they came back and won consecutive NBA championships in 89 and 90 before the Jordan yeah. rules, uh, you know, before Michael yeah. Jordan broke through. But, you know, they had to be tough to, to play the way they did, and you had to be tough, too. Like you mentioned, uh, there weren't a lot of women sports writers at that time. Uh, so you moved from the Pistons beat uh, into, you know, 
You're doing more long form, more columns. When you think about your career in that regard, um, you know, how tough was it for you, especially in the earlier years, to to find your place and hold your own in this business in terms of how, you know, guys were dealing with women sports writers? Well, it was... It was a new, th- you know, as I said, it was a new thing. And, um, you know, people know this that are in the business. It it was not just the athletes or the teams. It was sometimes colleagues, too, you know, mm-hmm. that would, would be difficult. And, um, you know, there's like scarce resources, scarce jobs. And, um, you know, back then there used to be these things where people would be cynical, like, how do you get this information? You know, that kind of like scurrilous crap. And, and um and you know, people thought they had the liberty to comment on stuff like your appearance or your um, anything, you know. Or they would, they would try to test you, or they would. Um, and so I always felt I didn't really. I got along with most people, but th- you know, stuff would happen, and and I always felt that um, it was important to handle it myself. I wasn't one of those people that was going to run always to management and um, mm-hmm. and say, you know, he said this to me, he said that to me, and. You know, I used to tell people, I will die before I cry. <laughs> <laughs> I will kill them first before I cry, you know? <laughs> and so I used to say, I'll throw a stapler through the window or whatever. I'm not, no, never, ever, never, never, ever. I'm like, oh, she cried? Really? Like, uh, <laughs> you know? like no. Well, you're from Pittsburgh. You had that toughness. Yeah, you know I, I mean? did. Right, right, I did. Right. I used to think, I told one guy, he said something to me, and I said, why do you think, I said, I'm just curious, because it was, in a way, you can, you know, it's not news, so and you've heard a lot of stuff, and, and sometimes it's almost like this clinical, anthropological thing where you're like, and I would just ask, I'd say, it was Kirby Puckett, and I said, I'm just curious, why do you think you could say that to me? Like, what is it about me that I exude that you thought you could say that to me? I just met you, like, 10 minutes ago. Why? <laughs> Because I'm sincerely curious, you know? And then he said something back, and I said, you're an asshole. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> but, you know, it would go like that. But, you know, the difference in sports is you have a wide berth, and you can talk like that. You can't talk like that in a boardroom, you mm-hmm. know? I just felt it was important to handle things like that on my own because um, I was going to see these guys every day. And you're not going to get much support in a locker room if you confront people uh, get into shouting matches and things like that. That's the kind of stuff that ends up on tape and, uh, you know, in the newspapers. So I would just sometimes walk up to guys and just tell them when they were making a scene, yelling at me or something, I would just walk up to them and whisper stuff like, you need to stop right now because this is going to turn out really bad for you. Mm. And, you know, it, it really helped in the NBA that David Stern had told, there were three of, I think three of us at the time, two or three of us that covered the NBA full time. And he called each of us and he's the commissioner of the NBA. And he said, uh, I want you guys to know if you have any trouble, you call me directly. Nobody else. That's great. You, you call me. And so the guys knew that. I think somehow the teams knew that. I don't know if he had put out a, a letter to all the teams or whatever, um, Chuck Daly asked me, we went to breakfast before the first season I covered them, and he said, why do you want to do this? You're a nice girl. Why do you want to do this? <laughs> mm. Come on, Daddy Rich. Come on. <laughs> Get with so, it. Yeah, um, but it got better and better, and a lot of the, you know, the tropes, the old stupid thinking went away, and women proved that they could do the job and write, and, um, you know, and uh, it's a lot better. Stuff still happens, but it's a lot better. Well, it's a lot better because of people like you. So, you, you know, you certainly held your own and, and, uh, and know so many um, other media members are grateful for that to help trailblaze like that. And, you know, you saw some of the worst things behind the scenes. But, you know, when you think about your career, you've also seen some great, great memorable things too, right? Yeah, extraordinary. And, and you, yeah, so when you, when you think about extraordinary, what, what does come to mind? Well, you know, people always ask, um, what's your favorite of sport to cover and it was really an event I I just always loved the Summer Olympics um, because you know and this was true of the NBA back then too I'm not so much into it now because it's just a clear out and you know guys go to the rim and finger roll and whatever it's it's not as exciting to me but 
When I covered the NBA nightly, you would see something extraordinary every night. And even though you're seeing 100 games a year, it was really true. The guys are amazing. Mm -hmm. And when I would go and cover like the NCAA tournament when the Pistons got eliminated and the guy would miss a shot from the corner, I would blink like, a you know, the college kid <laughs> would miss a what? shot from the corner. And I'd blink like, huh? You know, like <laughs> I, I got so used to how great they were. But the Olympics was really something I, I really loved because... Um, just the scale of it, and in in this, it reminds you of how extraordinary people are. Like the the virtuosity, you know, the talent and the and the ability and the determination and the the rigor and the training and the and the imagination and all those things. And so, you know, the first time I covered um, the Summer Olympics, and Ben Johnson was racing Carl uh, Carl Lewis in the 100-yard dash in Seoul. And there was 100, over 100,000 people, I think, in the, in the stadium. And when we were ground level, so they were running right past us. Um, and when the starter's gun went up, I'll never forget, the place was just, like, quiet. It was like a church. And the gun cracked, and it was like this roar, like this wall of sound, and they came flying. And to see a human being run that fast is also extraordinary. And Ben Johnson beat him, and then he got caught at like a couple of days later, he flunked the drug test. But he broke the world record by like, an, you know, an obscene amount. It was like not just a tenth, it was a few tenths. Like he just chainsawed off. And, um, and that was amazing. Or I... Um, when you see the yeah, I remember, I remember. Yeah, I remember you said you say that moment because that actually is my favorite memory of is the it? first Olympics I covered was in Sydney. It was the hundred meter dash, and like yep. you said, a hundred thousand people. Gun goes up, and I can remember at that moment hearing the helicopter above the stadium. It was right. so quiet. Yeah, I still hear, remember that, and it was just an cough. amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then it goes yeah, off and then it just explodes into this place. Yeah. Amazing. So that was my initiation. And, you know, and then, I mean, you name it. I used to, the ski jump. But I was so excited to go see the ski jump at the Winter <laughs> right. Olympics. You know, and we snuck on the, uh, we snuck on the um, chairlift before the event. And we're riding up just because we wanted to, it was me and another woman from the Washington Post. And we wanted to just see how high it was from the top because it's 90, you know, meters or and uh when we were up there the event started we didn't get off in time and so we we were hearing them going by in the air and they they do all kind of things they scream you know on their way down they they yell they go woo you know like, <laughs> <laughs> and i didn't know that you know so that was great um but I saw Dan Jansen win in his third Olympics. He had been the Colossus in speed skating, and he, he always had some horrible luck where his sister died of leukemia the first Olympics we covered, and then the second one, he wanted to win so badly he fell down um, mm -hmm. in the curve. And um, he was down to the last race of his life. He was going to retire, and it wasn't even his event. It was the 1,000 meters. Right. And he, he, went, he went around and broke the world record. His wife spun around and fell down. She fainted. <laughs> Everybody started crying. The Norwegian crowd sang to him. It was like the best thing we ever saw. The president called him. You know, we were all crying on press row. It was great. You know, we we're trying Amazing. not to show it, but we're like, you know, and then right. one of my buddies turned to me. He was a couple rows down and he turned to me and he mouthed the words, is that the best thing you've ever seen? And we were just like, yeah. It was the best. Yeah. What about in New York? You were in Newsday for 10 years writing columns, and that's not an easy gig. <laughs> you're in New York City, and your, your opinion's out there. Um, you had to see some crazy things, too. You were there for the uh, Clemens bat throw, where he threw the bat at Mike right. Piazza, right? Yeah, Stuff no, that like was that. great. That was great. That, that series, uh, we, we were telling Todd Zeal, he, he won a game with a hit, and... Uh, we went down to, we were, that game was at Shea, and we went downstairs and we were telling him when he got the winning hit, the, the press box was swaying. It was shaking. The stadium was shaking from the noise. And he said the ground was shaking too. Wow. And we were talking. But that, the thing with Clemens and Piazza was funny because 
Clemens claimed he thought the sh- big shard of a bat was the ball, and that's why he threw it. <laughs> no, wait a minute. He might have been a meathead, but he couldn't have been that dumb. <laughs> and we were like, uh, okay. And yeah. So, so we go to Piazza, and somebody asked him, what do you think his state of mind could have been? And Piazza had a great line. He said, I'm going to butcher it, but he said something to the effect of, are you asking me if he's crazy? <laughs> or mentally disturbed. It was something like that. He said it in the press box, and, I mean, the press conference, and we were all kind of like, mm, that would work. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's know? a good question. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, I was lucky when I got here. George Steinbrenner was still around, and, and that was a lot of fun because of the bombast and, and the, uh, you know, this kind of, he, th- he always thought he was General Patton, and so he would stride it and stride out, you know, and stick out his chest. like a, It's like almost cartoonish and... And then he loved it. He would say something inflammatory, and then everybody would stake out the exit where he had to go to his limo, you know, after the game. And um, and he would walk by. It was almost Trumpian, actually. He would walk mm. by, and he might say something, he might not, you know. And you'd be on the elevator. He took the same elevator t- um, to his box that we took for the press box. And sometimes he'd be with Kissinger. You know, sometimes he'd be with... Um, Billy Crystal, sometimes it just depended. And uh, that was always fun to see him explode and get hacked off. And <laughs> was he ever with George Costanza? I, no, <laughs> not, the, not on any nights I was there, but I used to love the stakeouts where they would, you know, everybody would leave in the seventh inning and like nobody covers the games with just one, Yankee games with just one writer in New York. So there'd always be like the third guy would have to go down and just stand there waiting for George to leave, you know? And it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, that series that they played against Arizona, and they, they actually ended up losing it, but it was one of the great series I've ever seen, World Series. Um, and, you know, Mariano Rivera ended up giving up the winning run on a bloop. But it was, it was just so full of drama and game-winning home runs and, and you know... Um, Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling against the Yankees pitchers and hitters and great stuff. I mean, I remember Daryl Strawberry getting booed at um, in Boston at Fenway. They were chanting, just say no, just say no, because he had had a drug problem mm-hmm. that everybody knew about. And um, they were chanting, just say no, just say no. And he was, he was always like really calm, like kind of like easy Daryl, you know, just really calm mm-hmm. and he went up to bat and they were chanting it and he just stood there and he, the pitch came and he just cranked it out of the park. It was like crack. And you knew it was gone the minute, you know, the sound. Mm-hmm. And it went out and he just, you know, he took his time running around and he got to, and he touched home plate and he just winked at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. <laughs> you know, and again, it just reminds you how, how amazing they are. They're pretty yeah. amazing. Whatever their other flaws, they're like savants when it comes to what they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You mentioned uh, a venue that I wanted to ask you about because I want to talk some tennis, and that's uh, Center Court at Wimbledon. I never yeah. was fortunate enough to, to cover Wimbledon, and I wanted to know what it was like the first time you walked into Center Court, even if it was empty. I don't know what the circumstances were, but do you recall the first time you went into Center Court? Yeah, absolutely. I am... I, um, and it's kind of a roundabout story because I, end, I ended up writing Billy Jean King's autobiography the past couple of years. But I was at the Washington Post. We had a writer, Alyssa Muscatin, who decided to go work at the White House. And she ended up writing speeches for Hillary Clinton. And so, you know, only in Washington. So George Solomon, my boss, comes to my desk and he says, I, I hadn't been there long. And he says, uh, how would you like to cover Wimbledon? Because Lisa had to leave quickly. And I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah. And I said, I would love to. So, you know, back then it was great. Newspapers would send you to develop your expertise early or to events, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the post was great that way. And so he said, why don't you go over early to Eastbourne and cover that tournament? It's a tune-up before the real one just to get acclimated. I said, great. I go there, I take the train, I cover it. Martina played there and I got an interview with her because I had written something about her previously that she liked. And, you know, I got a one-on-one. That was great. I get on the train. There's Billie Jean, whom I had met a couple times just doing other stories. 
And I reintroduced myself, and she was with her partner, Alana, and I said, I'm going to be covering tennis now, I think, and uh, this is my first time at Wimbledon. And they said, what? And I said, yeah. And Alana said, who I didn't even know, said, meet me at the Fred Perry statue tomorrow, and I'll give you a tour. Really? Uh, yeah, just, you know, kindness of their heart. And so I said, okay. So I meet her there, and she had been a player. She took me around, and it was empty. And, you know, there's the um, it was gorgeous because it's, it's, first of all, the grass is like suede. It's, it's mowed, you know, it's like a golf green, really. It's, and nobody plays on it the rest of the year. So it's just pristine when you get there. Everything's painted that dark green with the purple flowers, you know, mm -hmm. spilling out of these hanging baskets. And, and the, you know, the, the sprinklers are going and it just is almost, you know, poetic the way the, the water's spraying. And she takes me to center court and we walk in, and it's just it just like blows open in front of you. You know, when you walk out of these little um, corridors, it just pops up in front of you, and it's gorgeous. You know, and, and acoustics, I mean, it was like, I remember thinking, you know, people talk about like Carnegie Hall or wherever, but when you were watching a match when the people were there, it was the same thing. It would get incredibly quiet and tense. And then the minute something happened, you would hear like either the big wall of sound or they would go, oh, you know. Mm -hmm. It always reminded me of a courtroom. Like, mm -hmm. you know, somebody says something awful and they all go, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, in between, when, as the points are being played, you know, or it's like riding a roller coaster. Like somebody gets a drop shot and it's like they're going down the roller coaster hill or, you know, like, ah, you know, like it's unbelievable. And I... I still, it was one of my favorite places ever. I, I don't know. I think the roof changed the sound, you know, somewhat. But the sound was one of the things in addition to just, it's just gorgeous. I mean, it's perfect symmetry, not too big, not too small, you know, just gorgeous. The crowd's really knowledgeable, so they know what they're seeing. Do you have yeah. a favorite moment from Center Court that you covered? Um, yeah, it's funny because I'm trying to think. I mean... I had looked forward to seeing, you know, this is 1993. I had looked forward to seeing Martina in person because she was so athletic and played so differently than everybody else. And, you know, you don't realize when you, um, when you watch on TV how, you know, you're charging, she's charging the net and she was, she'd pluck these volleys off the ground like a couple inches down by her shoes and lift it over the net from four feet from the net. And you think... You know, or how did she know to cover the alley or, you know, whatever. It was, she would get to these things that were amazing. It was like really swashbuckling and exciting. But I also saw um, when uh, Federer was very young and he upset Sampras. And that was pretty amazing because Sampras was the best player in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. And on his way down. And I also saw um, when Jana Novotna blew a big lead against Steffi oh, Graf yeah. and mm. ended up losing and um you know it was heart the heartbreak that was something it was different there too because fleet street you know the tabloids back then would send these like piranha writers that weren't really sports writers they were just there to stir up you know today it would be called clickbait mm -hmm. and so they would ask these impertinent questions or embarrassing personal questions <laughs> there used to be a bounty martina told me there was a bounty on her once with photographers, if somebody could get her holding hands with her new girlfriend, they would get paid 15,000 bucks. Really? Wow. Because they could sell a lot of papers. There were like nine papers in, in uh, daily newspapers, I think, at the time in, in London, and they were so competitive. You know, that would win the day on the newsstand if they had something like that because people were fascinated with her back then. Um, I wanted to ask you more about Martina. Um, you wrote a great book called The Rivals, about the rivalry between Chris Everett and Martina Navratilova. That really defined, especially the late 70s, but throughout the 80s. Um, you know, I think of great, great rivalries like Ali, Frazier, Magic Bird. But even in tennis, you know, people say, oh, Borg, McEnroe. But I think they only played like 14 times. Right. But Chris and Martina played 80 times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, over 16 years. And, um, you know, they were... They were competing, um, one or the other was number one, I think for eight years straight or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was, you know, like this equi 
poised. I, they both ended with 18 Grand Slam singles titles. I think Martina ended up winning the head-to-head -head like 42-37, but it gives you an idea how close they were. And I do remember from writing the book, they played 80 times and 60 of those were finals. Yeah, it's crazy. So it was always a high-stakes thing. And, you know, and then it's like the old line in boxing that styles make fights. I mean, they couldn't have been more different um, temperamentally or stylistically. And so that was fascinating. And, um, and, you know, it was funny because a lot of the traits that were attributed to Chris were actually more true of Martina and vice versa. And, and so they, they had all these, one of the reasons I wanted to do the book was I, I thought that beyond the fact they were seminal figures in sports, not just women's sports, was the idea that, um, that they had been sort of these cartoonish depictions that weren't accurate. Mm -hmm. And I thought they had social import uh, beyond just their athletic greatness. And so I thought it was a rich topic. Well, even a, even a backdrop of what they played in at the time, you you know, you're talking in the '70s, the women's movement, the gay rights movement. Heck, the Cold War's going on. You got Martina who yeah. you know, came over, defected. You got yeah. Title Nine. So you had all these cultural issues surrounding that rivalry, which right. really made it interesting too. Yeah, I mean, and and you know, if you think about it on a timeline, Billie Jean kind of envisioned all the stuff that could happen and set it in motion, but. Martina and Chris were really the first generation that were sort of free of having to carve out a pace to play and, and could actually earn a living. And they kind of they kind of embodied it in flesh and blood, everything that Billy and the people of her generation, which was just a few years earlier, had fought for. And so, and you know, they were also the first generation in tennis and, you know, part of sports that, that came along in the television age where... They were covered on TV, and so Chris especially became kind of this cultural rock star where, you know, it's in the book where Andy Warhol painted her picture, and mm. she was, you know, she was dating Burt Reynolds and, you know, all kind of stuff. Um, so they were crossover stars, um, especially her. She had a ton of endorsements, and, um, and they also changed what people believed women were capable of, which I think was a big deal and something that Billy had started, but... Um, I think Billy won $100,000 in her first pro season after she created the women's tour with some other people, the original nine. And um, within five years, Chrissy made $1 million in a single year. So That's how, yeah, wow, in five the years. The velocity, yeah, the velocity of the growth was amazing. And Billy tells a story about running into Reggie Jackson someplace, and he was still not making big money yet. And he said... He almost fainted when he saw what they were earning. He said, you girls are making some serious bread. <laughs> <laughs> it was well, it just, was about time, right? <laughs> it was the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got, to, you got to know Chris and Martina so well, through, especially through writing the book. Is there, is there an, a story or an anecdote about either one of them or their relationship that, that, that sticks with you even now? Well, I mean, there's a lot of them um, because... You know, when you're trying to figure out what made them, I mean, the subtitle of the book, it's called The Rivals, but it's, it's, it's kind of, the subtitle is something like their epic duels and extraordinary friendship. And so one of the puzzles when you're trying to figure out the narrative arc or what to say about them is how could they have remained friends when they were battling each other every time for the biggest prizes in the sport and, and, um, and really what happened was they had separated themselves so far from everybody else that they were really the only two people that understood what the other was going through, you know, at that level. Mm -hmm. And so it, um, they kind of really had compassion for each other. And so they would, you know, kill each other on the court. And they had frosty times, but they would kill each other on the court and then go back and whoever lost would be consoled by whoever won. Like they'd feel guilty mm -hmm. a little bit that they won. Or... Hmm. You know, but there were moments um, when Chris was, I think some London papers had written that she was having an affair when she, her marriage was breaking up with John Lloyd and Martina was indignant. It was at the Australian Open and she was telling them Chris would never do that. She would never, whatever. And she called Chris and told her what had happened and said, don't worry, I stuck up with you for you. And Chris told her, well, Martina, it's actually true. 
<laughs> so they were, you know, fiercely like depending. And then Chrissy tells a story about when Martina could finally had her citizenship and could go back to Czechoslovakia for Fed Cup. And Chrissy had a knee injury, but um, she just went anyway because she wanted to be with Martina when she went home because Martina hadn't seen their family in years and had not been able to go home. And they're standing there and they start playing the national anthem, uh, the Czech national anthem, and it, which is called Where Is My Home? And Martina mm-hmm. started crying and uh, Chrissy just reached over and put her arm around her. It was like one of those Pee Wee Reese, Jackie Robinson moments or, mm-hmm. you know, right. where... Um, so there was real affection in addition to real competition, and they were always extraordinary to me how they were able to balance it. And they're still good friends. They're probably better friends now than ever. That's great, right? It's like yeah. that old cartoon, the sheepdog and the wolf. They clock in, they battle <laughs> it out, then they clock out and they go get a beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I mean, they had times when when they didn't get along or, you know, they would... I mean, Christy's very funny because she's very self-aware of her ego, and she talks, you know, freely about how when you're at that level, you have to be really selfish and that she used to just think people are going to have to put up with her as long as she's playing because it's got to be about like me, 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 you know, um, resting and eating and practicing and, and whatever. But she didn't, she said the last three years especially, she didn't really like it, mm. uh, who she was. And Martina said she felt like she became a much better person herself and a much better human being after those invincible years she had because it was just so driven. You know? Yeah, that's what it takes, right, to, to yeah. reach that, right? Speaking of driven, the, the door was really open for both of them and for women's sports in general by Billie Jean King, who you've yeah. mentioned. And, yeah. and you participated in the writing of uh, All In with uh, Marianne Volers. You guys wrote the autobiography about Billie Jean. That's a great read. I really recommend it. I've learned so much. You know, it's funny. I, I met Billie Jean a couple times, wrote a couple things, but I've learned so much to this book. I, I really recommend you reading it. But think about what Billie Jean King has meant, um, not just to tennis, but to, to sports. John McEnroe once said that she's the single most important person in the history of women's sports. And He's right. Yeah, he's right. And I, um, I think the thing that's remarkable about about her as well is she's still she's 78 and she's still indefatigable she's still working for this stuff I mean every day of her life I mean every day she's I mean she's and she's adapted to you know Twitter and Instagram and everything else she still travels and gives speeches and she has this sort of unsinkable sort of optimism and determination and um it's an interesting case study and, you know, if you're trying to persuade people, what's the best way to get it done? Like, is it to be in their face? Is it to bring people together and be, be kind of a conciliator? Is it, is it both, you know? Um, and I think she's been, you know, she's, it's in the prologue. She says, um, we wrote something about how, it always used to astonish her that people thought she was a separatist because she's always been an egalitarian. Mm. She's never been one of these radical, um, you know, feminists who's like, um, just thinks men have no right to participate in the uh, discussions or they can't relate to what people are going through or, you know, women, or, you know, that kind of stuff. It was, she actually, her leadership institute had a... Um, had an annual thing one year where it was just for men because she felt like the men were excluded too much from the conversation and you, mm. and you need the men to help you get things done, which made perfect sense. And, and so I don't think she gets enough credit. I think people see the bubbly, you know, little bit goofy stuff she does sometimes, like laughing all the time and, you know, and they don't give her enough credit um, for the gravitas and the, the amazing prescience that she had and how right she was about so many things um, and how it's all come true. None of this, um, she basically started the entire women's sports industry when they broke away at great risk to themselves and started their own professional women's tennis tour because the men were trying to basically snuff them out. Right. I mean, I think about it, it's, it's kind of been a theme of our conversation, toughness, the idea of toughness and what it takes. Yeah. I mean, 
I mean, what it took for her on the court, I mean, she won 39 Grand Slam titles when you when you talk about doubles and mixed doubles included, 12 of them single championships, um, former number one player. So she did all that on the court, but then the advocacy work that she did, founding the Women's Tennis Association, the foundation, everything that she's done since, um, you know, I just admire the fact that she was willing to put herself out there. Like, who would play in the battle of the sexes, right? Who yeah, would agree yeah. to go out there and play against Bobby Riggs in 1973? 90 million people watched that. Yeah, right. 90 million. And, you know, she didn't really want to, but he beat Margaret Court a couple months earlier. Margaret didn't really prepare or take him seriously um, and lost to him. And Billy was mortified and said, now I have to play him because uh, it was going to undermine everything she had fought for, she felt. And... Um, and, you know, even that was kind of genius because um, Bobby was such a hustler and she just decided to give him three months of blackout. He didn't get to see her. And it drove him crazy. <laughs> it That's drove great. Him crazy. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, the thing, so much stuff in her life, that thing changed her life and catapulted her. It's still the thing every day somebody comes up to her and tells her they watched it or they knew about it or something. But, you know... She got outed in 1981 when she had to go back to playing when she was 39. She had had something like six knee surgeries. And I was kind of bummed out because when we were doing the photos for the uh, book, you know, we had to cut some. And I was really fighting to get this one in because knee surgery was so primitive when she played. And there's a picture of her at Wimbledon tying her shoe or something. And you can see these crescent scars on her knees, like mm. all of them, because she had six surgeries. And um, she played on bad knees. She would fly to New York for a business meeting and fly back and play her match in the evening in Florida, you know, without warming up. She'd be running onto the court. Just just an extraordinary, and as I said, it's she's just never stops. I mean, she never has stopped, ever. And What's she, what she like to be around on a day-to-day on -day basis? Well, this is funny because I'm 62 and she was asking me, what are you going to do after this book? And I said, you know, I don't know. I said, I don't know if I'll do another book or I might be done. I said, I've been working, you know, 40 some years. I had, I had stage one breast cancer in 2017 and I, you know, was very lucky. It was early. I said, but, you know, I, um, I might be done. Journalism has changed and I don't enjoy it as much. I love the books, but, um. You know, I don't know. I said, I might just stop. And she goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what do you mean no? And she said, no. She said, I have ideas for you. And I, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I, you can't do that. You can't make me work. <laughs> but, you know, it's so funny because she just, she wants everybody to, you know, <laughs> <laughs> be on board like <laughs> <laughs> I think Billy Jean's right though I would agree with her don't don't stop Thanks, Jeanette pal. don't stop because uh, you've brought too much great journalism to sports in the last four decades I've really enjoyed your work over the years I really admire the toughness you showed throughout your career to help also be a trailblazer like Billie Jean in many respects and uh, I'm just so thankful that you've joined us today I've really enjoyed uh you know, going over some of the highlights of your of your career. Well, thank you for all those kind things. I'm not sure I have it coming, but I am. Um, I have enjoyed talking with you, and this is a great podcast. And I encourage people to keep tuned into it because uh, it's a lot of fun, and I think it's a world that um, is worth um, illuminating for people because uh, it's changed so much. Before it's like recedes into the mist and all that it would be nice to have <laughs> well, an oral history we can recede history. into the mist together <laughs> we'll yeah. have a drink don't tell Billy Jean we'll just have a drink and recede into the mist together <laughs> Todd no you're not no <laughs> <laughs> alright thanks again Jeanette really I really great, appreciate Todd. it thank you thanks for listening to Press Box Access you can find us here with a new episode every other Wednesday if you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe and follow us on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. We'd love for you to review us. Five stars would be nice. Follow us on social media. Drop us an email at pressboxaccess at gmail.com. And be sure to spread the word. Everyone is welcome here. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. 
A special thank you to executive producers Michael D'Aloya and Gerardo Orlando, producer Bill Hoffman, and our audio engineer, Nathan Corson. I'm your host, Todd Jones. It's closing time. Rock on. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Cherie Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures.